Now I have the utmost pleasure of welcoming back Joel for a quick chat. It's great to have you here again. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Of course. Uh, obviously, Paul does not exist in this alternate timeline or rather alternate history. That is huge. Please walk us through the thought process of that. Sure. So when we started working on the game, we knew that we wanted to have different factions. We wanted to have it set on Arrakis. And Paul, as a character, casts a shadow over everything that happens there. Um, he's such an important figure to the universe. And we were looking for, like, how can we bring players in, make them feel like they have some agency in this world and they're not just going to join Paul. <laughs> and so we, uh, we looked in the timeline, we worked with our partners, uh, the Herbert Estate and Legendary, and we found, like, a moment where uh, Jessica made a choice about the child she was going to give birth to. And in our timeline, she gives birth to that daughter. And that changes everything, right? Paul not being there creates this, uh, this real vacuum of power on the planet. It, there's still a lot of the same events occur because Duke Leto was still, you know, training this force of elite fighters that made the Emperor jealous, which made him make a deal with the Harkonnens, which made, you know, the Atreides still end up on Arrakis. But then because of the events that Jessica chose, she is now more tied to the Bene Gesserit faction and they have trained her as a truthsayer and she has the recognition of UA's betrayal before it happens. And that leads to the Atreides being prepared for the Battle of Arrakeen, which means that they manage to defend themselves, which means that they don't get wiped out. And that leads to these major factions being in conflict on the planet of Arrakis. Let's talk about Lady Jessica's decision uh, then, which, you know, started the whole thing here. Uh, obviously, with her complying to the Bene Gesserit rule of having a daughter, why did she even make that decision in the first place? Well, she's always been torn in her loyalties, right? She's, she she, she uh, came to the Duke and she fell in love with the Duke, but she also had the agenda of the Bene Gesserit in her mind, right? And then there's the other side of it, of course, that the Duke never made her his wife. Um, and she, she has to make a decision. And of course, in the book, she made the Paul decision. In our game, she, she made the, the Ariste decision. And that, you know, that, I, think, I think that people are very complex and she had these, you know, these very complex uh, ideas going on. And so torn in her loyalties, in this case, she chose the Bene Gesserit. So let's talk about Arista's, you know, part of the story then. Is she taking up Paul's mantle or is she just a completely different I mean, she is a completely different person. What's her agenda? What's her spiel? I mean, Ariste has her own path to walk, right? And she, the path of the Lisa al Gaib and the Kuzats Hadarak is not available to her. And it doesn't happen, um, you know, because events don't play out the same way. It doesn't, she doesn't end up in a situation where she has to face any of that. So she is a, a, a precocious girl. She grew up with the uh, Bene Gesserit training that her mother would have given to Paul, the Mentat training that Thufir would have given to Paul. Right, she has sword masters like Duncan Idaho training her and, and the great troubadour Gurney Halleck teaching her. So she has a lot of the same abilities and, and trainers as Paul, but she finds herself in a very different situation in the world because of course, the end goal of the Bene Gesserit here is that the daughter of House Atreides marries the heir of House Harkonnen in order to create their Kuzat's Hadarak. I do hate that for her, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so, so Ariste ends up on a, under a completely different set of pressures, right? And, and that, that leads to a very different sort of uh, life for her. So yeah, obviously with the Duke, uh, as well as the Baron both being alive, uh, what's happening to Arrakis, so to our beautiful planet here? Uh, who has fiefdom over it? What's the situation? So after the, after the war, um, or after the Battle of Arrakeen when the Harkonnen attacked, um, Duke Leto, petitions a Landsrad um, and the Emperor decrees that the war can continue on the surface of Arrakis, but it has to be contained there. So he, he says it's fine for them to fight as long as they're there, but he also declares that um, spice still has to flow, flow freely. So uh, he sends the Sardaukar to police the spice harvesting operations and make sure that spice still flows out of Arrakis and into the Imperium because it's such an important resource. So looking at Arrakis, um, in the trailer it does say at the very end, you know, the Fremen being the gone, essentially. Are, are they gone, gone? Or are we like figuring out where they went? Where I mean, are we at? I think that's the central mystery of the entire game, right? The Fremen are missing. Mm -hmm. Imperium propaganda would say that they've been exterminated, but we have our doubts. So as a player, 
a part of the core story that you'll be following as a player is find the Fremen. And as you play through the world, you walk in the footsteps, you find the places where the Fremen once were, you uh, explore their rights, you explore their culture, um, but where are the Fremen? And, and can you one day find them? I'm not going to answer that question, but that's part of what the story is all about. But they, their cultural impact is still very much felt as I'm traversing through Iraq is. Both, both their impact, like both the remnants of what they left behind when they left the abandoned sieges and things like that, but also the vacuum of power, right? Because the Fremen were, that was their territory and they were extremely fierce about defending it. And with them not in the area, other people have started to fill in the gaps. Um, I do want to talk about the, the impact that story and narrative has so on Dune Awakening because it, it is a survival MMO. If we're looking at the survival part, usually the extent of story in a survival game is, oh no, your plane crashed, oh no, your ship wrecked, oh no, it's an apocalypse, uh, figure it out. Uh, clearly, that is not the case for Dune Awakening. Uh, there is a lot of story uh, to be explored for the players. Absolutely, I think like the we want to give players a a clear journey to follow in the game, right? So they 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 can they can explore the world and they have this backbone uh, story thread that they're following through as well. If they if they if they're interested, if they're not interested, they don't have to care that much about it, right? <laughs> it's there, but but you follow a fairly in depth story and and it's kind of always plans within plans you know so you're always having to think about what people actually want and what the motivation is like why are you looking for the fremen is it a really important question that you should probably ask yourself as a player like what exactly have you been sent to do this for and i think these kind of uh these kind of elements provide a little more uh motivation for players as they explore the world I do love that. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts here generally? I mean, obviously by creating an alternate history and timeline, lots of different moving pieces, um, can we still expect to see similar beats that, you know, we know and love from the books or the movies? Absolutely. I think that just because Paul doesn't exist, a lot of the factions have, a, have the agendas that they had, right? And they're still trying to achieve the things that they were trying to achieve even when Paul did exist, right, in, the, in, in his universe. So. Um, you will encounter, first of all, characters who maybe would have died in the books due to certain events. Um, they're present in the game. You'll also encounter factions trying to achieve goals, but in a slightly different way because they don't have to account for the Paul element, right? <laughs> so for players, uh, it's great because I think Dune fans should get a kick out of exploring the way, that, the, the thought experiment of like, okay, if Paul's not here, what is here? And what are people trying to do, right? And I think that's, that, that kind of leads to very interesting consequences as you play. Yeah, I love the far-reaching consequences that has into the future of, uh, of the game as well. Um, we talked last time already about, you know, respecting the source material, which there is so much to draw from with the books and the movies. Um, how do you make sure when you're creating an alternate history, that's a big step. How do you make sure that you're not veering too far away from that source material? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's just a matter of like taking the source material as always the starting point. Like being able to extrapolate out in ways that are like as as logical as possible and being able to say, look, I started here at point A and my conclusion is, yes, I'm here at point B. And because of the old history, this this makes a a a lot of sense as a logical conclusion. So we start there. Then of course, we have like the, uh, the our partners at Legendary and the, the Herbert Estate who can keep us grounded and keep us in line with what we should be doing, right? So we, we run a lot of our stuff by them for, for fact checking. Like we have this ridiculously long timeline document that we've written. And it's I think it's like 10,000 words of just timeline. And then we sh we've shared that to get it approved by the Herbert Estate and things like that. So we kind of, we do our research and we always start with the source material. And I mean, I think it's pretty clear from everything you've said, from everything we got to see thus far, that there's a lot of love and respect for the Herbert's writing, for the source material we're also seeing from the movie. So I know for sure that the game is in very good hands with you guys, Joe. Thank you. I mean, I will say the, the one thing that we try to do is just make sure that we preserve the legacy. And part of the reason for doing an alter, alternate timeline is, is that we don't want to step on what's been created that's amazing. We want to do the sideways thing and not actually ruin any of the canon over there. And it's honestly so smart because in doing so, you now opened up this whole new alternate timeline for everyone.